Hey everyone, it's Jonathan, and welcome back to the Disney Movie Marathon. Today's episode is the third episode in our series looking at the different eras of Disney animation history. In the first episode, we talked about the golden age of Disney, and the five films that came before World War II halted just about everything at the studio. In the second episode, we talked about the films that came out during and after World War II, while the studio rebuilt from everything that happened there. In this episode, we're talking about the era usually called the Silver Age of Disney. This is the period of time that produced some of the most famous and beloved classics, and the last era that was directly overseen by Walt Disney before his death in 1966. Joining me once more are Mark Brown and Eli Sanza, and we'll be talking about all eight animated films from 1950 to 1967. Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, The Sword in the Stone, and The Jungle Book, as well as one hybrid animated film, Mary Poppins. Okay. Any thoughts on the Silver Age as a whole? It's better than the War Age. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. No, no, those are my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Silver Age. If I was going to summarize that, I would say it, a return to form. That's what it feels like to me. It's like the, the Disney was going through a lot of hardships in the 1940s. The animation, the animated movies were not in their best shape after Bambi and Dumbo and Fantasia and stuff like that. They only made package features. And Walt Disney wanted to get back to making full length features, so he took a gamble, did Cinderella. He wanted to do another princess story because Snow White was such a success, so he wanted to have another success with another princess, and so he made Cinderella. And because Cinderella was so successful, he was able to get back to making full length features finally. And that was in the 50s when he was also having success on television with the wonderful world of Disney and with the theme parks because Disneyland opened that decade. So the 50s was definitely a return to form. It was definitely Walt Disney finally getting his mojo back. Definitely. And like four of these like eight films, I think are like on my top favorite Disney canon films of all time. So it's a pretty good era. That was a really good era for like some of my favorites are in this era too. Yeah, this era is full of probably some of the most famous movies that Walt did. Of course, the, you have the golden era with the first five, but this is his other big films. Yeah, that's why they call it the Silver Age. Yeah, Cinderella was his first one back. And this one, I really enjoy. I didn't watch it a lot as a kid. I'm not really sure why. I think I don't remember if the library had it or not. Because that's how we watched most movies, was if the library had it, then we would watch it. And I don't remember if that was at the library, but we didn't watch this one a lot. So it was a nice, I guess, surprise revisiting it as an adult and finding out how great it was. I always loved, um, liked it, as well, um, but I think like you, I didn't realize how great it was until later on in my life when I realized, wow, this is this is actually a really, really great movie. I think just, you know, even animation-wise, not even story-wise, it's amazing, but I mean, just Mm -hmm. animation-wise, those, I still remember, like, when Cinderella goes to the castle, and there's, like, these soldiers, and you see the interior of the castle, and it's like, wow, it's mine, it's breathtaking. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unlike both of you, I actually grew up watching this movie, because we had this on VHS, and we watched it all the time, and I, I always loved this film as a kid and and it's one of the best of the of the silver age i would say but there are some things about it that are like oh wow this is like they spend a lot of time on the cat and the mice in this one there's a lot of slapstick comedy and it seems like they focus they focus on the mice and the cats more than they focus on the romance between Cinderella and the prince, which mm-hmm. is kind of on the kind of a thing that's on purpose because I know they're trying to gear this movie towards a wide audience and they think kids are gonna like the mice more than they like the romance stuff. I'm sure that's one of the reasons why they didn't they didn't want somewhere over the rainbow to be in the Wizard of Oz because they didn't think kids could care about this song. They they always trying to do that, always trying to dumb it down for kids. And so that's 
that you do. Some of that stuff is so is noticeable, but I am a fan of like Tom and Jerry. I like slapstick comedy, so it's not like it's bad or it doesn't ruin the film or anything. So like I liked that, and and I also liked a lot of other stuff. Like I liked the uh, I liked the villain. I liked the stepmother. He was a really good villain. I like Eileen Woods. He's a really good voice actor for it. Cinderella and totally empathetic. And the entire movie is really good. I think the cast of characters in this movie is really good. Like probably my favorite since Pinocchio, which I thought had the strongest cast of the Golden Age. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of really great characters and great villains too. The stepmother is such a great villain. And I don't know Mm. if you want to count the stepsisters as villains, but they're probably more like henchmen or sidekicks but i i like them in that role they're they're really entertaining to me yeah the the evil step the 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 wicked is it the wicked step or the evil step on what's what she called uh, I, think, I think it's mostly evil. I think they usually yeah. call her the evil stepmother. Uh, Although no, her name is Lady Tremaine. Lady Tremaine, yeah. I think she's one of, she's an unremarkable villain, one of the most foreboding. You could, like, there's like a scene, I think, where she, she squints her eyes and like the animation yes. goes dark and like you could see the, yeah. just the, the hate in her. And as the scene goes dark, her eyes stay glowing in the dark. Like almost she's like a demon. And I really like that touch. <laughs> Yeah, her eyes are like bright lime green, just really striking. Yeah. Speaking of demon, they have a cat named Lucifer. <laughs> they have a cat named Lucifer. Thank God. Good, good cat there. Yes. And he has a cat named Lucifer. A poor dog named Bruno, who I guess Disney just doesn't like their Brunos. <laughs> yeah, just, they don't like their Brunos in these days. It's, that's a shame because the Bruno in Cinderella is like the hero of the movie if you watch it. You see that. We don't we don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> we don't talk about we don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> Somebody should like do a remix of the we don't talk about Bruno, but put in footage of Cinderella and like Cinderella <laughs> chastising Bruno. <laughs> uh yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you know how the internet is. I'm sure someone's on it right now. Anto and Luca get the three Brunos together. Yeah, Luca, right. <laughs> but I, I'm, it's sad though that Cinderella, I think, is probably the Disney film that gets the most hate, or not just hate, but complaints from people who claim that it's anti feminist or a bad message. Because, and they, they blame, they say, it's, no, Cinderella should have run away or done something to help save herself and it's like have you seen the movie have you seen the, uh, yeah. the circumstances that she I was, was just in? gonna say the people, <laughs> the people who make all these arguments you can tell that they either have never watched the film or they're going off bad memories like they watched it years yeah. ago yeah. and they've forgotten a bunch of it exactly. like most of their arguments do not hold water when you actually watch the film it's like peter dinklage recently saying you know the dwarves live in a cave or something <laughs> <laughs> you 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 haven't seen the film, sir. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. They very they very obviously live in a cabin. Memorably live in a cabin. If you watch that movie, but also yeah, I see a lot of complaints about Cinderella from people like this who say that uh, she seems like oh like this is the kind of Disney princess we don't want anymore. We got we want princesses to be independent and we don't want them to rely on men and we don't like focusing on the romance because romance isn't all there is to life you have to like like have to be a girl boss and stuff like that and, so, and that's that's kind of like the climate right now and so you're gonna face a lot of like people who say stuff like that and although it's mostly nonsense because Cinderella's a perfectly good character and the thing I always say to argue in her favor that's a good role model good role model yeah yeah right you're right and the thing I always say in her, in her favor when I argue with people is that he's a character who is put in the worst circumstances but remains optimistic and gets out of those circumstances and the prince was mostly just a bonus. The, mm-hmm. any, the reason why Cinderella, the reason why Cinderella is such a popular story is because everyone can relate to being in a terrible situation and dreaming of escaping from it. And that's what's relatable about it. So it's not like he's a shallow character. He's a very human character. And then the problem with all the complaints about it is that any further adaptation of Cinderella, they always try to quote unquote fix the mistakes or fix the flaws. And then you get like versions like the, 
I didn't I didn't watch it, but I just saw the trailer for the uh, the one on Amazon and uh, yeah, just more, yeah. more more modern versions that they they pretty, <laughs> like you're, you're just you're just messing with the character of Cinderella at that point. Uh, yeah, I haven't watched that one yet, but it did get trashed by film critics and a lot of people on Twitter made fun of it for like <laughs> how much it deviated from the story in ways that were completely unnecessary by like trying to make Cinderella a businesswoman instead of uh, like a romantic lead or something like that. It's, it's um, like very unnecessary changes just to try to appeal to like independent, like just to be uh, quote unquote feminist, stuff like that. Yeah, I haven't seen that one either. It's one that I figured I'd end up watching eventually for the podcast. I haven't decided if I'm going to do it during my first round of Cinderella versions or not. I have enough, so I probably won't. I've, I've heard so many bad things that I'm not like in a rush to watch it. Fun, funny enough, it made it it made an appearance in the Oscars last night because um they had like the top five <laughs> the top five movies voted for on Twitter by like by people like the top five fan yeah. favorite movies and somehow Cinderella made two number two I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how either I was so shocked by that I was like wait a minute I understand why the Zack Snyder movies are here because the Zack Snyder fans are like super enthusiastic and they'll vote till their thumbs get sore but like well, I had no idea why the Cinderella movie from 2021 was on that list Who are, where are all these fans coming from my theory is trolls <laughs> oh that's a good theory that's a good theory <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised all, all I know is they shouldn't do the fan favorite thing in the next year's Oscars that's all I have to say about it there's a lot of things about the Oscars that they shouldn't do next year, but they probably will anyway. <laughs> no, you know how they are. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, anyways, back to our list of movies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving on to the next one, we have Alice in Wonderland. And I don't remember if I watched this as a kid or not. I think I watched it maybe when I was an older kid, like maybe into my teens. I don't remember watching it as a kid. I think I only watched it after I started getting interested in the story of Alice in Wonderland. I might have watched it once. I don't remember. The, the 1999 live action version of Alice in Wonderland is what kind of got me into the story of Alice in Wonderland. And then I started wanting to watch more versions. And I think that might be when I watched it for the first time that it actually like made an impression on me. So if I watched it as a kid, I didn't really remember it. So I watched it a lot more as an adult than I ever did when I was younger. So for me, this was, um, I did grow up on this. I did, this was my introduction to the Alice in Wonderland story. I do love this movie a lot, and it's pretty much on my top five favorite Disney movies, animated Disney movies, um, according to my last ranking. I just love the the nonsensical, just wonder, Wonderland, I guess. Just, the, you know, all the characters, the Mad Hatter, the Cheshire Cat, the orange hair, the the caucus the uh it, I, it's there's just something about seeing alice a sensible girl or a girl who's been told to try to make sense of things just in this world of nonsense and i think disney puts it over pretty well yeah this is one of my favorites it's really well done like what you said about how he, uh, they put a girl who's trying to make sense of a world of nonsense that's a really good comic possibilities in that scenario and they take full advantage of it in this movie because it's a really funny movie it's like one of the funniest movies disney ever made in walt disney's era and it, they reminded me of like a looney tunes cartoon that's that it that it cracks me up like the my favorite scenes are the mad tea party and everything with the queen of hearts and it. it was funny to me and like it was like a really trippy movie it gets it gets a little weird at the end just like the three caballeros it gets very trippy and psychedelic but it but it's also really really entertaining from beginning to end and it's and it's kind of underrated it wasn't it wasn't that big when it came out in 1951 but it became a cult classic and it started gaining popularity around the 60s and 70s and then that was when it sort of hit the zenith in pop culture and now Alice in Wonderland is one of like the most popular movies based on like home video and stuff like that. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland I think is kind of 
underrated these days. There's like a very yeah. small cult following that absolutely loves it. And yeah. I th- it's partly because I think just the story of Alice in Wonderland has a cult following that just loves Alice in Wonderland. It's it's weird. I, I like Alice in Wonderland and I started a series on my channel just covering the various versions of Alice in Wonderland that eventually became my podcast, every version ever. But when I do any version of Alice in Wonderland, it is far and away going to attract the most views. I don't know why, but there's something about Alice in Wonderland that there's a certain segment of people that absolutely love it. And they'll watch anything that I put out about Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. It is a cult. Then there, people love that story. I think we can all just relate with the, uh, you know, the nonsense of, the enjoyable, sensible nonsense of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lewis Carroll is a great writer. It's just the imagination that I that I really like. That's what draws me into yeah. it. I just like seeing. I get the weirdness. Like I, I like weird things, and I like things with at least watching the various versions of Alice in Wonderland. I like seeing how different people interpret all the weird things that are in the book. And well, like with the Disney version, they add in little weird touches of their own, like all the little creatures, like the little the bird that's glasses and the bird that's a mirror. I don't think those were in the book. I don't remember them at all, but yeah. I, it's little things like that, that people add in that their own little weird touches that I really like seeing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was some creativity with this movie when they created these pencil birds and these mirror birds and like these <laughs> horn birds and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And the mom rats. Every everybody has their own version of what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mom rats make an appearance. I don't know if the mom rats even appeared in the book, but they made an appearance in this movie. They're in the Jabberwock the poem, but I don't yeah. know if they're in the book. They're they're in the poem. In one line, mm-hmm. they're not described. Uh, yeah, 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 right. It's like, and the mome rats outgrobe or something yeah, like I'd, that. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah, right. Yeah, the Chester Cat recited that poem in the movie, but he didn't recite that in the book, I don't think. No, no. no the, the, right. the poem is from Through the Looking Glass, and the Cheshire Cat was in Alice in Wonderland. Okay, yeah, right. So, the, yeah, they combined Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass in this movie a lot. Yeah, but most versions do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's very rare to find a version of Alice in Wonderland that sticks strictly to the book Alice in Wonderland. And yeah. it's just very rare to find any version that either does one or the other and not combine them in some way. Yeah. You're, you're totally right about that because t- I was surprised that Tweedledee and Tweedledum were not in the original Alice in Wonderland book, but they, they, they made their first appearance in Through the Looking Glass. And yep. most yeah, most versions of Alice in Wonderland have Tweedledee and Tweedledum. So you're right. Mm-hmm. They, most of the time, they do combine those stories. I, th- I think part of that is probably from this movie, from the use in this movie, because they're kind of iconic because of the Disney version. Yeah, I would guess that same thing, yeah. I would like to say it is my unbirthday today. <laughs> mine too. Oh, no, no. and mine too. I just had my birthday recently, but it's my unbirthday today. So oh, a very merry birthday to us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a coincidence. Well, moving on from Alice in Wonderland, we get to Peter Pan. This one I remember watching several times as a kid, but I haven't seen it since I was a kid. I have not seen it recently. I will watch it very soon because it's coming up in the podcast where I am now in my order of reviewing these. So I will watch it soon, but I haven't seen it since I was a kid. I know it's one of the ones that has become controversial in recent years because of certain portrayals of Native Americans. So I'm not quite looking forward to that because I remember certain things about them. I don't remember everything. But thinking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can see how that could be quite <laughs> offensive. But I, di- I didn't think anything of it as a kid because I was a kid and I didn't know, know to think about that kind of thing. Right. I also grew up on this one and I did like it a lot as a kid. But um, the last time I saw it was a few years ago. And I remember that I did not enjoy it as much as I remembered enjoying it. And it, didn't, it didn't really have anything to do with the controversial matter or anything. I just found I just found myself 
bored or just like mm. I just couldn't get interested in the film and I don't know why exactly but um I do love the um I love the darlings I love Wendy Michael mm-hmm. John um the parents <laughs> and they're, they're they're like my favorite Disney couple probably um Mr. and Mrs. Darling mm-hmm. and um, yeah it's a very <laughs> short list <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Right. There's too many dead mothers, right? Or dead. No, just yeah, dead mothers. You see, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. Eh? There aren't any couples because all the mothers die. Yeah. So it's the darling to Anita and Roger. That's pretty much it. Anyway. Yeah. But, um, Rapunzel's parents. Oh, yeah. Queen and King. Yeah. What's their name? Um, I think the Queen's name is Ariana. I don't remember the king's name, and I don't think they're ever said in the movie. I think I just know that because of the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I do like the Peter Pan sequel better than the mo- original movie. But again, I have not watched this in probably over ten years, so I need to rewatch it to get a better opinion. But um, I think that was the last takeaway I had from it. I've never seen the sequel. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. You know, you never saw Return of Neverland? No. I remember, I yeah. vaguely remember when it came out, and I remember wanting to see it at the time, but I never did. And I don't remember, it probably was because the library didn't get it. Because, like, if the library didn't get something, <laughs> we never saw it. Right. So, yeah, I never saw it when I was a kid. And then by the time I was old enough to, like, start getting movies for myself, I started realizing how terrible all the Disney sequels were. And then I just stopped uh, watching yeah. Disney sequels altogether. <laughs> oh man. I used to be, look forward to watching Disney sequels because I thought, Oh, I really loved that first movie. I probably love the second one too. And and I was so naive back then. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, back to the, to, to Peter Pan, I, I grew up watching this movie too. I also really liked it. Like I watched it a lot. Loved the characters. Loved Tinker Bell. I loved Captain Hook. I loved that crocodile. That crocodile was great. It's it, this is a little this is a tricky one because it's like it's like I liked it. It's a good movie, but there are some a lot of things about it that are lacking. I think like it, like they spend a lot of time focusing on Captain Hook and not enough time focusing on Peter Pan and Wendy and the and the other kids. Like I feel like it's like a Captain Hook movie mm-hmm. sometimes, which I think is, and then which which I I I talked about this before in my review. Like I I said, it's noticeable how they do that, and it's and it's understandable why they do that because like you get the feeling that the people who made the movie think that Captain Hook is the best character. Like the villains are usually always the best character, so I see that, and she's probably the most entertaining, and that's why they focus so much on him, and they probably think the lead characters are usually boring, so that's why they don't focus on them so much, which, which is sort of unfair to the lead characters, but also Captain Hook is a great character, so it's so it's not like that ruined the movie or anything, because still Captain Hook is still entertaining. So I like that. It's just I just point that out because it's really noticeable. It's very noticeable that that's what they're doing. And that sort of breaks the spell a little bit, but but o- overall, I think the movie is really well done. It's like it's got a lot of funny moments. I really love Cap- the Captain Hook and the crocodile battling each other. Like that's just like I said with the cats and the mice and Cinderella. I really love slapstick comedy, so that stuff cracks me up. And uh, yeah, so mainly, it's a good movie. It's not my favorite of the Disney movies, but it's good. I like it. And we're getting a live action remake. Oh yeah. That's coming out like this year, isn't it? I think. Peter Pan and Wendy. Yeah, Peter and Wendy, yeah. I feel like this one has uh, this has more potential for a, a remake than others because Peter Pan is a story outside of Disney. So depending on who is making the remake, they could focus more on stuff from the book than the actual Disney film because like Cinderella, the live action remake of Cinderella It was its own thing. It had nods to the animated version, but it was its own thing. And I think that Peter Pan has more potential than some, like The Lion King. (laughs) Like, like I always have to come back to Lion King. I think it has more potential than something like The Lion King, where it's just basically a shot-for-shot remake, because it has a book that it can go back to. Yeah. Well, The Lion King is the ultimate example of how not to make a live action remake. So it's, a, it's that's why you always go back to it. It's, mm-hmm. 
Well, wait, wait yeah. for that um, live action the Aristocats. That'll be something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder how that one will work. Yeah, that's that's sort of a hard one to imagine. I, I have a feeling it'll be another Lion King because the Aristocats does not have source material. It's something that Disney made themselves. So, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. The, the Aristocats is not a beloved film as much as a lot of other movies they made. So who knows? It might be better than the animated one, for all we know. It could be. And the Aristocats does have a dedicated following. There are there are fans who really love the Aristocats. So. I like it a lot, man. Well, oh, well, including me, by the way. So I am not trying to bash it or anything. I really love the Aristocats. But yeah, but I'm just saying the consensus is that yeah. it's not that good. Well, from Peter Pan, we can move on to Lady and the Tramp. This one I watched several times as a kid. I remember I really liked it, and I remember thinking that the rat scene was terrifying. Like the, mm-hmm. this, this movie might be one of the movies that's responsible for me not liking rats as on film. I've gotten over uh, that nowadays, but I remember thinking the rat was, the rat scene was terrifying. But I still liked it, especially because Tramp kills it in the end. Oh yeah. So that's like the most memorable part of this whole movie for me was the the scene with the rat. Even though it was terrifying, I still liked I still liked it. Yeah. Yeah, I watched it a bunch as a kid. I don't remember watching it much as an adult, maybe once or twice, but I still like this one. It probably will be high up on when I eventually make a ranking. I have a feeling this will be on the higher end of my ranking. Yeah, this one is also a good one to me. And when I rewatched it like about 10 years ago when I was doing my ranking, I th- call this a probably the most perfect animated Disney movie because it was when I couldn't really find any real flaws with it. The animation was amazing. I had no problem with the animation, no problem with the story, uh, no problem with the characters, no problem with the songs. I I really liked it a lot and I loved the the wide the widescreen aspect of it as well mm, but it, yeah. but it was never a favorite movie of mine like i could uh, like I, I like it and i respect it but it's not like my top 10 favorite movies yeah i, I i'm kind of with mark on that it's not the disney movie i think of first when i think about my favorite disney movies not because it's a bad movie it's just it's just it gets overshadowed by so many other movies but it's but if i judge it on its own merits it's a good it's a great movie actually i really like it it's, I, it's one i didn't grow up with i have watched that one well into my like i think i was a teenager when i first watched that i was, I was not uh, a child when i watched that i was not the one the ones who grew up with but it, but it was a good one i liked the scene with the rat the rat scene that jonathan was talking about is like uh that it is terrifying it's it, and i see why it would be if you if i if i was younger so maybe i dodged the bullet there but i uh, but i really loved the scene of outside the italian restaurant when lady and the tramp were eating spaghetti i thought that was well done i like frank thomas's animation of them eating the spaghetti and then kissing when they meet each other's noses was like that's some brilliant stuff and the scene uh where uh the Peg is singing the song He's a Tramp, like a lounge singer. That one is also like my favorite scene. Those like so so there are a lot of highlights to the movie that are really entertaining. So it's not bad or anything. It's so I I am probably gonna rank it like high when we get to the end. From Lady and the Tramp, we move on to Sleeping Beauty. And I think this is probably the one princess movie that I watched the most as a kid. Like, I don't remember watching Cinderella much. I don't remember watching Snow White very much, but I remember watching Sleeping Beauty several times as a kid. And then when it came out on DVD, right around the time we got our first DVD player, this is one of the first ones that we bought. So we watched it a bunch then. So like thinking of all the different princess movies, this one is, way up there for me not really because of the princess because she doesn't do a whole lot if you really think about it (laughs) but the other characters in the movie are so great i love the fairies and of course maleficent is one of the best disney villains of all time oh yeah 
the movie at the time it was kind of a failure but to me it's one of disney's best in just in terms of animation and just the style it's just it's so good yes even beauty is a good one um it's not uh Again, it's not like my top 10 favorites, but I do um, like it a lot. And I admire the animation and the uh, like tapestry, like layout of how the backgrounds look and stuff like that. And Aurora is a, a wonderful princess, one of my favorites. And I always feel bad again about the, uh, the criticism she gets. And it's like, it's very stupid criticism, like, She's sleeping through the whole movie. Well, I mean, it's called Sleeping Beauty. What, you, what, what were you expecting? <laughs> it's, and it's like, oh, why did she put herself in this? Because she pricked her finger. Like, did, you know, she was under a spell and did not know that the pricking <laughs> finger would lead to, to any of this. And, you know, Prince Philip kissing her is the only way to break the curse. But anyway, that's just me <laughs> with arguing with people. Anyway. Um, I, I do like it, and um, I, well, uh, a un, an unpopular opinion I have is I, I'm not the biggest fan of Maleficent. I've never uh, she's fine, but uh, she's never been like I know most people consider her the best Disney villain or one of the best, but I never I never loved her that much. I don't know why she never stands out to me like Cruella de Vil or Shere Khan or Frollo or Jafar or the evil queen or whatnot, but yeah, she's she's always just been okay, which is why I didn't really care about the Maleficent movies afterwards, which yeah. pretty much retconned the whole Sleeping Beauty story <laughs> anyway. Let's not get into that. But <laughs> they're they're an alternate universe story. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, thank you. Yes. Okay. Fair, but um, yeah. Anyway, some really, I, I do like. It. I think it's fun. And Once Upon a Dream is my favorite Disney romantic song. If we're not counting Johnny Fedora and Alice Blue Bonnet, and yeah, I, right, right, right. I like it. Yeah, I, I kind of my point of view about this movie is kind of controversial because okay, so I like it. It's good, but it's like I don't, I don't like it as much as a lot of other people do. And I, and I think the reason why possibly might be unfair because i like i compare it a lot to snow white and cinderella and snow white and cinderella i thought were way better uh they were uh, a lot more entertaining the sleeping beauty i uh i when i first watched it i didn't like it because i found it oh this isn't as entertaining as cinderella than snow white the, this is uh, not as funny uh, it's just like the villain is not as great although i grown to love Maleficent now. Like I agree with Jonathan that Maleficent is a great villain. I like her now. And and I like the movie now a lot better now. I, I, when I was a kid, I didn't like it that much, but when I grew up, I appreciated a lot more stuff about it. And now I actually like it. And this, and my favorite thing about it is how it looks. It's, uh, it looks amazing. Ivan Earl is the name of the uh, artist who set the style for this movie that's very different from how Disney movie used to look. It's like angular and straight lines and like like looks like the, like a tapestry. I like the how stylish it looks. It was almost as if it was trying to like blend in with like the UPA style, which is like a, a limited animation studio that was super stylish that was founded in the 40s and was really popular in the 50s. It felt a little bit like I was trying to look, it was trying to blend in with that because that was the style that was really infiltrating animation in the 50s. So that might've been why they did that. But yeah, overall, I think it's a, it's a fine movie. It's like, now I really like it and now I appreciate it way more. When I was a kid, I found it a little boring. Now as an adult, I. I like it more now because I because now that I'm an adult, I can appreciate stories that aren't so comedy focused and a little bit more dramatic and dark. Now I can appreciate those kind of stuff more, so that's why I like it now. Yeah, I agree with you. It's the of the three Disney Walt Disney princesses. It's definitely the the least of the three Disney films. Snow White and Cinderella are better, and it's interesting that you know. For a, a company known for its princesses, Disney would not make another princess movie until 30 years later with The Little Mermaid. So, yeah. You know, wow. It's, but, 
Well, there was a reason for that because because like Jonathan said, Sleeping Beauty failed at the box office, so they yeah. didn't. So they didn't think that people liked princesses anymore, so they didn't want to touch it because they thought it might have been box office poison. And I find it interesting that when people think Disney, they think princesses, but like when you look at the sixty films of the canon, there are only like what thirteen, fourteen that are princess films. Yeah, and usually the princess movies are successful too. So like they don't have to worry about that. It's like they always are gonna work. Like like it worked with Cinderella, it worked with The Little Mermaid, it worked with Tangled, it worked with Frozen. It's like in every era people love princess movies. For me, I think what you're saying about not liking it as a kid, I must have just been a different kid because I liked this one. But I also loved Fantasia yeah. as a little kid. So <laughs> I yeah. guess I was just a weird little kid. No, I'm glad you loved it more than I did. <laughs> I, I think it, one thing that I loved as a kid, and of course it's still awesome now, is the dragon. Like Maleficent turning into a dragon is just oh. iconic. I love that scene. Yeah. I loved it as a kid. It's one of my favorite scenes now. Yeah, that's that's yeah. one of the things that makes it stand out for me. The dragon battle is a highlight. I'll give you that. That one it was probably always my favorite scene. Well, from Sleeping Beauty, we move on to 101 Dalmatians. And this one is another one that was watched many times when we were kids. We, did, we didn't own this one, but I think we knew somebody who did. And I think we borrowed it from them and watched it a bunch. And then we borrowed it from the library a bunch. So this one got a lot of replay in our house, even though we didn't own this tape. But yeah, this one was always a favorite as a kid. And of course, now just for nostalgia's sake, of course, and if, it, it has a lot of good stuff about it too. It has a lot of people criticize the look and I know Walt did not like the look of the Xerox, but I think it gives this movie its own flavor that I really like. And I know a lot of people do like that about it now. And of course, Cruella is such an iconic Disney villain. It's yeah, yeah. She, she she's one of the things that totally makes this movie. Yeah, this is a favorite of mine as well. And yeah, I've never had an issue with the animation style. I I liked it a lot. Um, it it fit the story they were trying to tell, I think. And um, you know, like I said before, Roger and Anita are also one of my favorite Disney couples. <laughs> I love the story. The, of the Dalmatians and the characters are amazing. Jasmine and Horace are hilarious, and uh, Cruella de Vil is just she's she's a really beautiful villain of just like how 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 evil she is about you know finding these puppies to kill. Like I, I really yeah, I yeah. like her a lot. I, um, not talking about the that live action remake, but um, of yeah. Cruella, I mean, <laughs> and. Um, but yeah, I, I like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. I also really loved this movie, too. It was a favorite of mine as well. I grew up watching this. It was like, got a lot of play in my house, too. Uh, it's, it holds up. It totally holds up as, as an adult watching it now. It's like, it's, I'm amazed at how much I love it to this day. It's exactly as much as I loved it when I was a kid. It's really well told. I love how it's a story about dogs doing what like humans can't do. Like the humans aren't going to help us of dogs. Sorry, not going to help us instead, which is kind of funny when you think about it. And Cruella de Vil, yeah, great villain, one of my favorites up there with like Scar and like Captain Hook and like the stepmother from Cinderella. Like those are like top tier for me. She and uh, I think uh, Cruella de Vil is up there too. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a really great story. I really like it. And it's one of my favorite Disney movies of all time. Also, I wanted to comment on the animation style. I also really love the, the Xerox, very sketchy look of the movie. Like, I know Walt Disney didn't like it, but I was a big fan of that, too. This is also the first um, Disney film in the canon that I think takes place in the modern era, if we're not counting, like, the package films. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think. I think so. Yeah, they have a television in that movie. I think that is the first time that's ever happened. It, it, it for I know what you're saying, but it also depends on when Dumbo is supposed to be set. Because Dumbo oh. potentially could be, but okay. it's not. Yeah. It's not super clear as to exactly when Dumbo is. You might be right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it isn't super clear, but like that one's iffy. Dumbo might be the first. But as far as being able to tell, yes, this is set in the time that it is being made. Definitely 101 Dalmatians. There's no doubt about that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, from one of my favorites of the era to probably one of my least favorites. Uh, (laughs) We get to the Sword in the Stone. I remember watching this as a kid. I liked Madame Mim, and I was very bored with the rest of it. And I don't think I watched it more than once. (laughs) And then I watched it later on in life, and I was like, this is weird. This this has almost nothing to do with the story it's supposedly telling. A little late. It's supposed to be the story of King Arthur, and it's kind of not. It's a bunch of random cartoons. Education of yeah. King Arthur. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna. I have a different opinion than you guys. I I really like this movie. Actually, it's one of my favorites, uh, and that could be because I grew up with it. I watched this a lot, so I might have a nostalgia for it. But I always like. I love Merlin uh, as a character. Like to mm-hmm. this day, my dad still references Merlin's um magic bag that he can shrink everything into to fit. So like whenever we're doing a task and need to pack stuff up, my dad will always make a reference to that bag, and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just love the Merlin and Arthur, and I I, I just like I don't know I love the overall not just themes but setting of this movie, and mm-hmm. uh, I I'm not a big Madame Mim fan. Um, sorry, and I'm not. <laughs> I feel I feel the squirrel the, the squirrel scene. I think goes on for way too long, but besides that, I do love this movie, and it has one of my my two favorite. Um, scenes in any animated disney movie one of them is in here and that's the wizard's duel which i think is was one of my two favorite like i said uh, disney scenes ever so yeah i really like this movie okay yeah i'm kind of the complete opposite of mark because i did like the movie and i like the squirrel scene and the madam Moon. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and john nothing yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh you know uh, going deeper into it though uh yeah the the movie i did not grow up watching this movie a lot i took me a long time to finally watch it and when i finally did watch it i was like wow that was kind of like kind of a weird movie kind of mediocre i thought like i thought it could have been a little better i i uh, thought the scene with the squirrels i like the reason why i liked that though was because it was like it was one of the the few times during that movie i was actually invested in something that was happening in this film because it was like oh this squirrel is in love with this boy but he doesn't know he's a boy and so when he, he he finally finds out it is a boy it's like devastating and it's like that there was more emotion in that scene than in the entire film which <laughs> which that was that could just be a short film and it would be more entertaining than the entire movie to me one thing i will agree with mark on though is that the, the wizard duel between merlin and them that was definitely one of my favorite scenes in the movie it was like probably the creative highlight i loved how they were transforming into a bunch of different animals to figure out how to best each other and it was yeah, that one was really good and but 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 overall i I found it. Well, I I kept wondering what what is the what is the point of this movie? This mm-hmm. seems like the plot is going nowhere. It's mm-hmm. like it, 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 and not not a huge fan of uh, I'm not uh, Merlin as much as Mark is, or, and uh, he has some funny moments. It's just it's just I wish there were more funny moments. It's like that's so basically, it's just I feel like it's, it's not bad. I just talked about some of the scenes I love, so it's like above average for me. I also like Archimedes a lot. He's a nice grumpy owl, which I enjoy. Yes. And, um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I think I also like the songs because this is the first animated film that the sh- anime Disney film that the Sherman Brothers did the songs for. So I like mm, hearing their, early, true, yeah. their early work. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Maybe this Vegas Because Mom is a song I sing a lot. I like the the one they sing as fish. I forget how it goes now, but um, I do like that song. Oh, I remember that one. That, mm-hmm. the, that's what makes the world that's go what around. That's makes the world go around, yes. So I think... That, I love that song. Mm-hmm. That's a, I love that song. It's a great song, but yeah. Another small highlight, because I grew up with the sing-along songs, as I said before, um, that song was, was one of the songs on it. So I heard that a lot, but I never watched the movie a lot. I just remember hearing that song a lot. And you're right, the Sherman Brothers, that was their first 
Disney, which was an important movie in Disney's history because of that, because that was when they when Sherman Brothers worked with Disney for the first time. So well, like, for, for animation, yeah. I think they for, were for, for, for animation, right. Yeah. right. Oh, you're right. You're right. That yeah, for they they wrote the songs for the Parent Trap, didn't they? Correct. Yeah, I think the Parent Trap was the actual first Disney film. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Sword in the Stone, I feel like, is one of those that has potential for a live action remake because there's well, well, it's there's based so on much an there's so much series of books, if I'm not mistaken. That too. Yeah. But as far as just the movie itself, I feel like there was so much. Like you, even if you liked the movie, there's so much unused potential as far as the story of Arthur and his ascent to the throne. There's so much that this could have done that it didn't do that I feel like they could explore in a live action version. Well, they are making a live action one, so <laughs> we'll see. Right. Yeah, you know, I heard that they were making. Uh, you know, I actually haven't read the book that that movie is based on, but I heard from people that it really deviates from the source material. But I'm I'm going to just assume that all the stuff with turning into the fish and the bird and the squirrel probably wasn't in the book, and if it was, it wasn't drawn out as much as it was in this movie. I, I assume the same thing. Right. But I feel like if they if they take the bones of this movie and some of the more memorable characters and scenes, you've got to, you got to do the wizard's duel, of course, because that's one of the best scenes in the movie. Oh yeah. If you, they use that and then keep going after he pulls out the sword and the stone, the sword and the stone, it's the titular scene doesn't happen until the end of the movie. So <laughs> it's like, there's so much more that they could do. So a live action version of this, I think, has potential to be one of the top tier live action versions. And I know that's not saying much with some of the ones that they did. There's not a great track record, of, so it doesn't have to do a lot to be great compared to the others. But yeah. I still think it has potential and could be quite good. I think I agree. Agree. Well, the last movie in the Silver Age is the last movie that Disney, the last animated movie that Disney worked on before he died, and that is The Jungle Book. This one I remember watching several times as a kid. I probably didn't watch it quite as many times as like 101 Dalmatians or Lady and the Tramp, but I remember this being like one of the very first movies we ever borrowed from the library. So it goes back that far for me. And then I watched it several times spread out through my childhood. So it wasn't one that we went back to all the time, but it was one that we went back to occasionally. And I also had a giant puzzle of the Jungle Book characters. It was like a 300-piece puzzle that took up like half the kitchen floor because it was giant puzzle pieces. So the Jungle Book was always like a presence in my childhood even if we didn't watch the movie all the time. So it's one that I definitely have nostalgia for and is probably one of my more favorite ones for that reason, just because even if we didn't watch it all the time, it was always there. So I'm the same like you. Like I distinctively remember the first day I borrowed this book. We borrowed this this movie from the library. I remember it being because it was one that I hadn't seen yet. And then I saw it at the library one day. I'm like, Oh my god, I gotta get this one. And <laughs> we borrowed it. And um I remember liking it ever since day one. And um uh one of the characters, Baloo, Bagheera, Sher Khan. Sher Khan is my favorite Disney villain of all time. And I love the voice actors, I love the, the songs, Great Sherman Brothers and as well as Terry Gilkison uh, songs. And um yeah, it, it's one of my favorites. Agreed. Totally agree. This is one of my favorite Disney movies of all time. I grew up watching this one too. We had this on the, in the clamshell VHS box too, and we got a lot of viewing out of it. And uh, I also love all the characters like Mowgli, Baloo, Shere Khan, King Louis, the Vultures, Ka, all of them. It's such a great cast. And I really love the songs too. Sherman Brothers did not right bare necessities just to let people know that because sometimes they get credited with that but yeah, that was because the, of the, Terry Gilkison. Terry, yeah 
Eric Yelkison, like Mark said, he was the guy who wrote that because Terry Gilkison was writing the songs for the movie, but then he got let go and the Showman brothers replaced them, but they kept Terry Gilkison's Bare Necessity song because everybody loved that one. So that was the one song he made that stayed on. The Showman brothers wrote everything else though. And uh, yeah, and, and Jungle Book is like a really good movie. One great, one of the best uh, in terms of their animation, a really good character animation. One of the best in terms of emotion. It's one, like one of the most heartfelt stories. Baloo's relationship with Mowgli, really like the core of the film. Like a great buddy film, a great comedy, a lot of funny moments, a lot of highlights. It's like uh, one of my favorites. Like um, there are clip there are snippets of like the other songs that Terry Gilkison wrote for for the movie when he was originally on, and like a lot of them are pretty sorrowful or or like very it's not the same um vibe as what the movie became. Uh, so you could probably I know yeah. I know the DVD the platinum edition DVD has them, but you could probably find them on YouTube as well. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I heard that the, the that was the reason why they let him go, and I think that was had might have had something to do with the reason why Bill Peet, the storyboard artist, was, was uh, quit too because I think he used to be working on it, but he quit because it was going in a direction that he didn't agree with, and and I think it was because he and Harry Gilkerson were making a movie that was darker than what Disney wanted. Disney wanted something more lighthearted and funny like it ended up being and and i think that was the reason why there was some creative issues behind the scenes they probably were wanting something more close to the book because i think the book is a lot more darker than the disney version like a lot of oh books yeah to disney versions yeah, are definitely. yeah this, this is the, the this is the example i always go to when i think about how movies deviate from the source material a lot of the time when they adapt their book. This is the one I always go to as like an example of how it actually can work well when they do that mm-hmm. because the Jungle, the Jungle Book movie from Disney is totally different from the book, but I still love the animated Disney version of the Jungle Book. It's a good movie. It's just that Walt Disney is a person with a very particular style and he knows what he wants and he knows it works and so he just he thinks of source material as jumping off points for his own brand of filmmaking most of the time that's what he always does and um well Disney I think if the story is true he when he hired when the Sherman brothers came aboard he told them don't read the book that was that was his instruction to them. Yeah, I remember that. I remember learning about that. Yeah, that's all right. Don't read the book. We're not doing the book. Yeah, that's interesting. The book itself, if I remember correctly, it's not all about Mowgli and Baloo and Bagheera. That's only like a couple chapters. Like there's mul- there's multiple stories in that book. It's literally the Jungle Book. Right. Well, you know how like they killed Jiminy Cricket in his. The true, first true. scene he was in in the original story of Pinocchio. <laughs> so this is not the first time that Walt Disney has completely changed the intention of, of, of a source material. Yeah, and like for all the flack that Bambi gets for being dark and killing off the mother, the book was way darker than the movie. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I hear. I, I heard Bambi, the book was not a kid book. No, is that true? I read it as a no, child, yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. it was not. It was not a kid's book. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. Wow. It's just. It's interesting that like Walt Disney read that book and thought, "Oh, let me make an animated movie aimed at kids out of it." <laughs> it's just interesting that that happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not a kid's book. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that live action remake. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm wondering if they'll go more with the book or if they're just going to stick to the movie. I would like to see them use a little bit more from the book, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I have no idea how that one's going to work, but I'm uh, definitely going to watch it to see how they do. Yeah. And speaking of live action remakes, the jungle book has had at least two, and it was one of the first ones that ever got a live action remake. Yeah. I think 93 was the first 
94, I think. Jungle. Okay. Yeah. 94. We watched, we, that was another one we watched a lot as a kid. I'm not sure if we watched, we probably watched them about equally. We liked both versions. We, we, we liked the live action one and the animated one. And I think that one was one we borrowed from the library, but it could have been one we had on a tape too, because when we figured out how the VHS player could tape things, we taped a lot of things off of the TV. So that could have been one we taped rather than borrowed from the library, but I know we watched it a bunch. We really liked the live action Jungle Book. And then of course they got the, the new one, which I actually like the new one too. It's different, but I like that about it. I even I I even like the scene that everyone hates with giant King Louie. <laughs> everyone likes uh, to yeah, criticize yeah. that scene, but I love <laughs> that scene. It's so weird. It's just so weird. You have Christopher Walken as this giant ape. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like yeah. how weird it is. I love that scene. It's Christopher Walken singing, uh, I want to be like you. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't bad actually. I, it wasn't as like. It's easy to make fun of it. I guess I, I get it. I get it. But but it it was. It, it didn't take me out of it or anything. It wasn't ridiculous. It was. I was going along with it, and I was entertained. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I like it. I I like all three versions of the movie. Well, well, it was like live action Disney movies is Mark's thing. Did you ever see the the version from 1994? I did. I was not really a fan of that, but the um the recent remake, I I didn't like it, but it was it was good. I had to give it a B. I, I couldn't fault it, but um, it it's not like a favorite of mine. Yeah, the 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 94 version, I I I. I, I I think I remember watching it as a kid. Like I think it came on Disney Channel once, uh, but I wasn't into it because I was like, "Oh, this one isn't as fun as the animated one." I think that's what I was thinking. So I was like, "It was hard for me to get into it." It was like, uh, Jonathan, you can tell me, was this one like uh, like more serious than the animated one or something? Yeah. Um, or was it was it comedic moments or anything? Or was was I haven't seen it since I was a kid, so I don't remember as much for comedy. Uh, okay. But I remember it being more action oriented and more suspenseful uh, i think the bad guy ends up like dying like he gets suffocated in a pile of sand or something so it, it's wow. it's more it's it's not for little kids but we liked it as kids <laughs> it was it was more okay. exciting than the than the animated version so it's it's a different story and Mowgli is an adult in this version too it, if if not an adult, then an older teenager. I don't remember for sure oh. how old he was. So it it has a totally different flavor than the animated one. Right. So the 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 as for the uh, 2016 uh, version from John Favreau, that that one actually I really liked. It was it was good. It was like I the, the animated version from the 60s will always be king to me. That one is like untouchable. But like. But this live action remake was actually not bad. It was actually pretty entertaining, and especially the computer animation that brought those animals to life and like was impressive. Mm-hmm. That was another a whole other layer of entertaining was just watching how great it looked. But yeah. but I also just re- I really liked how well it was done. It was like well directed, well written, everything. Yeah, for me, that's what makes them makes a live action remake good is when they do their own thing. It doesn't always work, but it's a much better chance of it being really good if they can put their own spin on the movie. Yeah. That's the only way they should do it in my opinion. Is like otherwise there's no point. You just just do, if you're going to remake any movie, you have to do it something completely different with it. Mhm. Well, that's the end of the Silver Age animation, but we also have one hybrid film in here probably the most famous of all the disney hybrids mary poppins that came out between sword and the stone and jungle book never heard of it <laughs> <laughs> this one i don't remember watching it a lot as a kid until we borrowed it from somebody and then we watched it to death we watched it like every day or every other day until we had to give it back we watched it so many times probably for probably at least a couple weeks if not a month 
And then once we gave it back, I think we just tired ourselves out of it because I don't think I watched it again until I was an adult. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but it is a really good movie. I really liked it. I think I did get tired of it, but that was because I watched it way too many times at that specific moment. But going back to it now, it is a very good movie and I really like it. I really like how they integrate the animation with the live action. The songs are all amazing. Of course, Julie Andrews and the whole cast is great. It's just, it's such a good movie. Yeah, it really is. Um, I also remember when I borrowed this from the library, but this was right when DVDs had started coming out and the library was getting DVDs. And at the time, they only had like a handful of DVDs and we had just got a DVD player. So then this was, I borrowed the Mary Poppins DVD from the library and it was my first time seeing the movie. And I think I liked it since then. I can't remember what I thought of it at the first time, but ever since then, it's been a staple in my household. I love the movie. It's uh, on my live action Disney blog. It's the only one that I have a hundred. I gave a hundred percent to, and mm. it's my favorite live action Disney movie. And one of my favorite, not just Disney films, but films of all time. I think it's hands down Julie Andrews' best film. It's hands down David Tomlinson's best film. Hands down Dick Van Dyke's best film. Hands down, the, is the you know the Sherman Brothers' best um, score and songs probably in in a film. I it's it's literally a masterpiece. Yeah, I completely agree with both of you. It's a, I think it is a masterpiece. I think it's perfect. I think I I said this in my review for the movie that like if I tried to point out all the highlights in this movie, I would just end up describing the entire movie and that's basically how i feel it's just it's, it's just every scene is just entertaining and it's it's a really it's a really heartfelt story that my my favorite disney song of all time is in this movie by the way like feed the birds is my favorite disney song walt's favorite as well it was walt's favorite too yeah like which is amazing to me but yeah i really love it all of the songs in this movie i really love and I also agree with both of you. Julie Andrews is amazing. She's great. The Penguins anim- animation and their scene with Dick Van Dyke, that was really technically brilliant. That was how they created that. I was never bored once watching this. It's so good. I, I remember I, when I was a kid, I didn't like it as much. I remember liking it. And I watched it a lot. We didn't own it, but I remember watching it a lot somehow. I don't know how we did it, but I remember watching it a lot. And I remember thinking as a kid, I didn't like it as much, but the, every single time I watched it, the more I watched it as I get older, the more I love it, the more I appreciate things about it, and the more I realize how perfect it is. Even Dick Van Dyke's British accent doesn't ruin it for me. That's how great this movie is. That's how great this movie is. Yeah, well, like, when I was a kid, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of like an iconic accent now, the, the bad British accent. It's kind of iconic. <laughs> yeah. Mary yeah. Poppins. That Mary Poppins, as I live in breathe. It's like, <laughs> so, it's like, you could... <laughs> you can make fun of it easily, but it's but it's not. I wouldn't call it like that movie corny. Some people call this movie corny. It's not. I don't think it's corny. I think it's actually very heartfelt and a very sincere like story about. And, and, and I think David Tomlinson's character, Mr. Banks, is goes through like a really good character arc from going from a really hard edge stiff serious business person to being someone who like actually likes to spend time with his kids it's a very touching story it's like very moving story it's like about a a guy who learns how to have fun that's what it sort of is he's sort of like the the core of the movie like even though he's like the adult like you would think the kids would be the core of the story it's actually sort of about him and that's and it's a really great story uh and they tell it really well I basically love everything about the movie. Okay. Well, now we've come to the ranking part. This one is going to be a little bit harder for me. (laughs) I have a few that I feel like are kind of tied, but I guess I'll try and rank them as best as I can. (laughs) I think we'll go from worst to the best again. I'll start this time. My least favorite, of course, is Sword in the Stone. (laughs) That's the bottom for me. It's not 
a terrible film, but out of all of these, it's the least memorable and the one that I feel like has the most room for improvement. And then after that yeah. is Peter Pan. And I think that's mostly because I just I haven't seen it in so long that I don't really remember a ton of it. It's not really ever been one of my favorites. So, yeah. And then the next two, I think, are me. Well, I don't know. The, the, maybe the next four are all just kind of tied. I don't know. Yeah. The, I'll just, the, my next four, I'm including Mary Poppins in this. Um, I have The Jungle Book, Lady and the Tramp, Mary Poppins, and Cinderella. They're all just so good in their own way that I, without watching them all again right now to like figure out my favorite, I, I can't really figure out what order I want to put them in because they're just good. They're all good. Like Walt Disney just was good at making animated films. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. even his worst ones, they're still good. My next three are all hard to rank again, but these are my three favorites from this era, which would be 101 Dalmatians, Sleeping Beauty, and Alice in Wonderland. And all of them I like for different reasons. So again, it's really hard to rank them. 101 Dalmatians is probably the most nostalgic one. It's probably the one I watched the most out of these as a kid. And it's one that's just so easy to go back and rewatch. It's just endlessly rewatchable. Such a great villain. Sleeping Beauty, it's probably my favorite from an artistic standpoint. I love the animation. I love the backgrounds. I love all the different stylistic choices they made. I love Maleficent. It's so good. And then Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, for whatever reason, has become one of my favorite stories recently. I think it's just partly because I started the series on my channel and it's just made me appreciate the story more. So now it's by default, the Disney version has become another favorite. Plus, it was always a good one. It's always one I liked. I love the animation. I love the visuals. I love the imagination. I love the characters. Yeah. So it's really hard to rank them. So I'm kind of ranking them in chunks. (laughs) But (laughs) if I'm forced to pick one as a top, I probably would pick Sleeping Beauty just for the overall artistic standpoint. But if I was to pick one that I really want to watch right now, probably Alice in Wonderland. But that's partly because I haven't seen it in quite a while, and I watch. I just want to watch it again. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's hard to rank these. They're so good. What about you, Eli? Yeah, I would rank them. Uh, let's see. Uh, I agree with you about the Sword in the Stone. The Sword in the Stone would be the worst for me. Uh, Sleeping Beauty would probably be next. Sorry about that, Johnson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Lady and the Tramp, I, I I said back when I was talking about Lady and the Tramp, I said this one, I'm probably going to rank this one high, but no, Lady and the Tramp, like, I underestimated how much I loved all the other ones, like, yeah. but that's how good, that's how good these movies are, so yeah, Lady and the Tramp would be next, and then it would be Peter Pan, and then Cinderella, and then Alice in Wonderland, and then my top uh, my top ones, which I love the most, The Jungle Book, then 101 Dalmatians, then Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins at the top. Okay. I guess my turn. And the bottom is Peter Pan, like you, uh, Jonathan. And then um, probably Sipping Beauty, sorry. <laughs> And it's not that I don't like it, but it the rest are just so good. And Lady and the Tramp next. And then the top five are going to be hard. Uh, I guess the Jungle Book, then the Sword of the Stone, then Cinderella, then 101 Dalmatians, and then Alice in Wonderland at the top. And then if you include Mary Poppins, where would you put that one? Oh, I don't want to think of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess I guess it would be number one. I figured. Dude, this is a, these are really. It's hard, you're right, Jonathan. It, it, it was hard for me to rank these because these are all really spectacular films. Mm-hmm. And they're they're all so good in their own ways. 
Like that's what's hard for me with ranking things is because different films I like for different reasons. So it's hard to say this one's better than this one because, well, it may have one quality that I really like. The other one has a completely different quality that I really like. So in the end, when I rank things, I feel like my rankings are always fluid. Like if I rank them again in a year or two, it'll probably be totally different. (laughs) You know what? You know what? Like sometimes I say I like 101 Dalmatians more than the Jungle Book. Sometimes I say I like the Jungle Book more than 101 Dalmatians. It just depends on my mood or whatever. It's like yeah. those two. I have I have trouble with those two. Yeah. At least we all agree they're better than Home on the Range. <laughs> they're better than Home on the Range. I still haven't seen Home on the Range. <laughs> 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 oh my god you should uh lower your expectations that'll probably help you enjoy it better <laughs> my expectations yeah. are already as low as they could get from all the things i've heard yeah. about it yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sure what if you go in to home on the range with low expectations y'all i'm sure you'll find something that you like because you you'll probably think oh that's not as bad as people say it is that that'll just help <laughs> I'm sure it'll it'll help you enjoy it better. Yeah, low expectations do help. Yeah. (laughs) Anyways, I guess that will be all for our Silver Age ranking. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad we did these. It was a really good discussion. I really love these films. It'll be interesting in the future when we move on to like the Bronze Age. That's going to be probably a very interesting discussion, the Bronze Age. I would agree. The Bronze Age is going to be interesting. I have some things to say about those films. (laughs) Okay. Well, in the meantime, do you guys want to let people know where they can find you if they want more from you? Mark? You can check me out on my blogs, The Animation Accommodation at theanimationaccommodation.com. I post uh, reviews, top 10, top 13 um, lists, and I have a game show, Who Wants to Be Millionaire Animation Edition, which I host there. And of my live action Disney project at my live action Disney project.com, where I try to review and watch, watch and review every single live action theatrical released and Disney Plus released um, film. So, yeah, check them out. Okay. And Eli? Yeah, I have a blog uh, called the Entertainment Junkie Blog, and you can go there by visiting ejunkieblog.com. That's where I talk about the history of movies, TV shows, video games, like the entire entertainment industry, and I talk about celebrities and like their careers and like the creations of all our favorite arts and entertainments, and I go deep into their history, and so I like to do that. And uh, I'm also on Twitter at ejunkie2014. That's where I spend most of my time, and if you visit me there, I'll send you the link to my blog. Okay. Well, this was a lot of fun. We will see you again in the future when we get to the Bronze Age. Looking forward to it. Same here. Thanks for listening to the Disney Movie Marathon. If you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform or to our YouTube channel. Make sure to follow my co-hosts as well, and if you want more content from us, check out one of the other podcasts in the I Heart Movies Podcast Network, or check out my brand new Patreon. My link tree, as well as any other relevant links, will be in the description. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.